be seated. We are going to go to our various stages of scripture class. The youth, you know where you are supposed to be, the young adult, the children, their class is downstairs. The um, women to my right hand side, the men to my left hand side, Let's take the various places to get the best from our teachers. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Uh, we all have one class for the both men and women. So uh, our brother teaching can come ahead. Here. Let's bow our heads in prayer. We have just sang to the Lord. We want to commit our hearts to that song. That we will not be moved by the things we see in this world because this present world will be destroyed by fire. want to pray that the provisions of God in this present world will make us, will help us to make heaven and also help us to help others to make heaven. There will not be things that will make us to miss heaven. We will not be like Solomon. want to pray that the things that the Lord has gifted unto us will be a source to encourage us to make heaven. David said that God should make him to be rich, but not to the point that he will have his mind stayed on those. And God should help him not to be poor, so he may not go after those things. That is why we're here this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the song of commitment we have made unto you, that they can take the guys of this world. They can take the riches, the glory, the kingdoms of this world. But we will take Christ. And Christ alone will keep us to the end in Jesus' name. Father, speak to us your very word. For in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We are welcome to our Saturday scripture classes this morning in Jesus' name. Last week, we looked at Christ prohibit. Last two weeks, we looked at Christ prohibits divorce. Christ prohibit divorce in its entirety. That Christ does not like divorce. And I pray our marriages here on earth, the Lord will keep them in Jesus' name, until we get married to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, hereafter. Today, we are looking at lesson 48 of our Saturday scripture, and the topic is proper perception of riches. I pray that in this study, the Holy Spirit will give us understanding and perception of what true rich mean, proper perception of riches. Anybody to challenge us with the memory verse in Matthew 19, 21? Anybody? Matthew 19, 21. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. We read it together. Matthew 19, 21. One to go. Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, 
Go and sell that thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Matthew 19, 21. Sell that. If you want to be perfect, sell that which you have. Because your mind is stayed on your wealth, on your riches. Sell them. So your mind will be focused in heaven, in the kingdom of God. And we will see today how that young man, filled with piety, the very thing that he had his heart on, Christ touched it. Is there anything that we have our hearts on that we cannot sacrifice for Christ? I pray at the end of this such scripture class, we will not only have piety, we will also be perfect towards God in Jesus' name. Our text is taken, we have about three texts, but we are going to re read from one of the, those texts. Matthew 19, 16 to 30. If you see it, you read for us, please. Matthew 19, 16 to 30. In Mark 10, 17 to 31, and Luke 18, 18 to 30, we look at them when we go through this study. Matthew 19, 16 to 30. Any brother, any sister? From verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou we enter into life, keep the commandments. And said unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt no commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I cared from my youth up. What like I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go, and say thou that thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then, Jesus, then said Jesus unto his disciple, Verily I say unto you, that, that, a, rare, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I said unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus feared them, and said unto them, With men, this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all, and follow thee. What shall we have de therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that had forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Verse 30. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Thank you, my brother. We see a young, rich ruler. He was not just young. He was rich, and he was a ruler. And born out of the heart of piety, he approached our Lord Jesus Christ. And he called him good master in verse 16. Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And some of us came out of such, you know, orthodox churches we attended, and we thought with the good life, we thought with, you know, our good character, we thought with our good personality that that can take us to heaven. Give arms, 
help the poor, and even help build the churches. And I bet you this young rich ruler did all this, and he said he did it from his youth. So it's almost like, oh, from the youth, I've known the Lord. I've known, you know, I go to church. I do all those commandments. But Jesus, looking through him, saw something he lacked. And he knew that his heart was fixated on the wealth he had. And Jesus now touched him at that point. You've done all these good things. Good. And before then, Jesus had to correct him that there is no one that is good except one person. And that is God the Father. Why did Jesus have to do this? Correct him. Jesus did not want him to, you know, understand that, you know, he, he yes, he is God, but he doesn't want the man to look at him as somebody, you know, who, you know, had also, you know, followership and riches, and that he depended upon his, you know, followership and those riches. And so he said, there is none good except one, and that is God. So why was this correction necessary? The correction was necessary because sin, Satan, induced nature has gotten hold of mankind and all have seen and come short of the glory of God. So there is no one perfect, there is no one good than God the Father, who out of his love, constrained by his love, sent no angel, sent no elder, sent no cherub, but sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, a sacrifice for me, for you, for mankind, that we may restore the relationship that was broken in the Garden of Eden. So the demand by our Lord Jesus Christ on this young rich ruler and all of us is to keep the commandment. That same thing Christ teaches his disciples. He teaches you and me. He said, and when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Here we see the significance of responding to our Lord Jesus Christ's demand to have eternal life. And we also see the danger of trusting in earthly riches. And salvation is only made possible through the grace of God. We're going to look at three points. Self-righteousness of a rich young ruler. We're going to look at startling revelation on the rich, rich, slim chance of making heaven. And finally, satisfactory reward for Christ's followers. Is there any reward for me, for you to follow Christ? Remember, at the time, Peter said, I go a fishing. And others followed him. But at this point, Jesus Christ then answered Peter in verse 27 and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What then shall we have therefore? And we'll look at the response of our Lord Jesus Christ to Peter, who forsook all and followed him. Point one, self-righteousness of a rich young ruler. We'll look at it in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In his self-righteousness cloak, our Lord Jesus Christ saw through his flattery. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, and that is God. So Christ actually married this title. But to prevent a misconception that borders on his purpose and mission, his purpose on earth was not to be a title, chief doctor. 
professor emeritus. That was not the purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that should not be your purpose and my purpose. Remember in the early times, some of our leaders, I know of a leader who interviewed me for pastorship 29 years ago. He was a seasoned chartered accountant, a state overseer, and then a national overseer. When he had the call of God in his life, in those early days, you can count chartered accountant back home. He was already making good money. He abandoned that for the call, to answer the call of God upon his life. I know a minister in Joss. He was a registered engineer, Koren. When he had the call of God in his life, he burnt his Koren certificate. And this is somebody. When he ministers, like I wrote, challenged us last weekend, Ignite, you see the power. He ministers on Thursday in programs. And before he comes, the whole place is packed full. And he prayed. From the time he came for that, comes for a program, he remains in the bus that brought, you know, him and his uh, church people, his, his, his district. He will pray until he, he, he gets to the pulpit and you will see things happen. Aru told us about Steve Akinola, which I know personally. He goes to his room. As he comes for the program with GS, pray. And when he comes out, things happen. I pray that God, with the last program, Ignite, that you and me will be ignited and our churches will be filled up in Jesus' name. We see that the purpose of Christ was not to have a title. He's already King of Kings, Lord of Lords. His purpose and mission, he said, let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person. This is Job. Neither let me give flattery titles unto men. Our leaders, in those, in, in those days, our group coordinators, they wouldn't go to school, some of them, because they had this commitment, this challenge, that you and me want to have titles. Doctor, professor, pastor, doctor. Pray that God will help us. It's not good. It's not bad. I mean, it's not bad to have those titles. But if that is our pursuit, if that is our mission, if that is our purpose, it is contrary to the mission and purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can see the rich young, young ruler knows the scripture. Christ even attests to this fact. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not be a false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these you and me have done. When we're in our daughter's churches, all these have I kept from my youth of what do I lack? The rich young ruler felt a sense of lack for which he needed our Lord Jesus Christ to clarify him. And what did Jesus tell, tell him? Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him because he was closer to the kingdom but yet he was not in the kingdom and the lord said unto him one thing thou lackest go thy way sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me riches are good the program at GCK, we need money for the program. But like this young rich ruler, he had his heart fixated. And Jesus saw through him that he has his heart fixated on riches. At this instance, the young man was grieved. What did he do? He left sorrowful. Did he repent? No. He had great possessions. To some of us, it may be our certificate. To some of us, it may be our jobs. To some of us, it may be one thing or the other that we have our minds on. And I pray that the Lord will help us to be focused in heaven. What should be the attitude of the rich in the church? 
Anybody? What should be the attitude of the rich in the church? What should be the attitude of the rich in the church? Yes. The rich in the church, number one, should be humble. Um, their wealth that is given to them by God should be used for God, um, for the propagation of the gospel, and it should be used to help the needy. Thank you, my sister. It should be used to help the needy and the propagation of the gospel. We come from communities. I thank God one of our pastors challenged us. He single-handedly with his family built the church back home. Such projects are going on in some of our communities, and they need our help to reach out. I pray that God will help us, that this blessing has blessed us with, and continue to bless us. We use it for his purpose and the propagation of his kingdom in Jesus' name. Point two, startling revelation on the richest slim chance of making heaven. Startling, is startling from our study today, how it is very slim for the rich to make heaven. But let's not misunderstand that Abraham, he was rich. Let's not misunderstand Isaac, he was rich. Let us, let not us misunderstand David, he was rich. But these ones, by God's grace, make heaven. And I pray that we will be rich, we will make heaven in Jesus' name. So we can see the whole of wealth in the heart of the young rich ruler. Christ sees this scenario. He expanded to his disciples the danger of inordinate quest and confidence in riches. The Bible says, and when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man, a rich woman, to enter into the kingdom of God. Luke 18, 24. From this Christ statement, we see some attributes. Number one, we see the difficulty of salvation of rich people. Number two, we see nothing less than the grace of God can enable a rich person salvation and sanctification. Number three, it is equally impossible for a person who sets his, his or her heart upon riches to make heaven. The Bible says, he that trusted in his riches or in her riches shall do what shall fall, for the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Remember Solomon. It was God picked him up and God blessed him. And soon the riches took him from the presence of the Lord. He multiplied himself in women, multiplied himself in things of this world. Number four, the way of heaven is fitly compared in our scripture today with the needle's eye, which is the disciples retorted, who then can be saved? Matthew 19, 25. So the Lord gave a comforting response to the question by the disciples. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So God has made provision for you and me to be rich. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou might prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospereth. God wants you to be rich. God wants me to be rich. But he wouldn't want you and me to have our mind fixated on it because we're not going to meet him with those riches. And he doesn't want us to be distracted from the mission he has given to you and me to make disciples of all nations. So the Lord gave a comforting response. The things which are impossible with man are possible with God. So God has made provision for all riches. He said, behold, I wish above all things that thou mightest prosper and be in health, even as our souls prosper. So in the scripture, we see godly men like I said, Job, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Hezekiah, they were all rich, but they were not 
distracted from the plan and purpose and mission of God for them. In those riches, they use it as a means to accomplish God's purpose and mission in life. We can see our region of Asia left family to another country over two years. Did not put mind in riches. into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful laws, which drown men in distortion and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which why some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We can see some, Demas has forsaken Paul, forsaken the purpose and the plan of God, the mission, and followed after this present work. I pray that will not be a portion in Jesus' name. Finally, we look at satisfactory reward for Christ's followers. Is there any reward for you? Is there any reward for me? Mark 10, 28. Mark 10, 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. There is a word for labor. However, we must hold that fast which the Lord has given unto us. And what is that? Our salvation. That no man take that away. Take away our crown. And believers are to give all, give all to follow Christ. Knowing that the Lord he shall receive from the Lord the reward of inheritance. And there is none that has left all and followed Christ. That's the question of Peter. Now that we have left all, what shall be our reward? And the Lord said, even in this present world, the hundredfold, and also in the kingdom to come. Let's go to God in prayer. Proper perception of riches. God gave us those riches. God gave us those health. God gave, gave us those certificates. God gave us those businesses, those jobs. The purpose is for us not to allow those things to distract us. You don't want to be poor. God doesn't want you to be poor so you don't steal. God doesn't want you to be so fixated on the riches he has blessed you with. I want to talk to God this morning. Proper perception of riches. Wealth is good. We need it in the church. We need it for the mission. We need it for the ministry. But our mind is not fixated on those. On the certificate, on the job, on the mansions, on the wealth. No. Christ had no place to lay his head. If, if that was the purpose of Christ, you'd have had mansions. He came to seek and to save those who are lost. And if he has saved you, that's your purpose, that's your mission. Our Father Lord, we thank you, Lord, for... You did not left us without any hope, the hope we have in Christ, that you have blessed us with good health and riches and wealth, and the essence is to serve you with them, Lord. Father, we pray they will not take us away from your kingdom in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. For in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. As we wait for our colleagues who are concluding, let's just pray, pray for ourselves. Let's pray the Lord will help. The Lord is going to help us. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenging issue. He's going to help us to remain in the faith as we are pursuing one thing or the other in this life.
take us away from the Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from our search of scriptures? Any questions? Okay, okay, yes, that you can go ahead. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, good morning, church. Good morning. So the question is, um, is wealth a negative influence in spirituality? And the reason I say that, I was working with a colleague who was from another church. I was in Southern Maryland. And <clears throat> through discussion, we both came to realize that we belong to different churches with different beliefs and attributes. And he didn't mention to me, he said, look, I'm old. I should not be given this much money from the mega salary I earn, whilst my pastor and his children are driving, I mean, like a helicopter, and then they buy shoes, you see them come well, dress in church, um, buying all these fancy clothes. So, so, I mean, this gives me the, the belief that should pastors be really rich, will that distract them from the work of God? That's my question. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's a very interesting, a very interesting question. So, pastors, we should be poor. <laughs> should the pastors be poor? Okay. Um, I think the, the, the issue, I think the question really about riches is not, is not having them, but it's managing them. And also, you don't get rich at the expense of other people. There are many ministers, men of God, uh, since I don't want to mention names, there are some who, they will, they'll be riding on a helicopter, not even a plane, they, they'll have the actual big plane, taking them all over the world. But the congregation is struggling. There are people who are struggling. The church is not making progress. Not just about individuals being poor, but I'm talking about where as a church, instead of making progress, let's say you, you plant more churches, you, you build other structures. The church can't do buildings because the pastor wants to fly all over the world in his own flight, in his own plane. So that shows you the challenge of, um, it's, it's all about having uh, satisfaction in life. There's a challenge about riches. Riches, if you're not careful with them, they, they will, I mean, you, 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 you will not be satisfied. You, you, there's no contentment. So the more you have, you realize how poor you are, but the more you have. Because the more money you have, you realize that there are some people who have more than you. So that's what makes people now to be competing now. So they are not satisfied with what they have. So this pastor is, he realizes he, he himself is driving a Mercedes Benz, but there's another one who has a chopper. He has a helicopter. So he realizes that I'm not actually rich and poor. So if you are, there's a competition in the heart that would drive you to take some wrong behaviors. At the expense of the congregation, the overall kingdom of God will still suffer, but the pastor is having a very good time on, alone. So it, it has to be a balance. Uh, so it's not wrong to have your own chopper or aircraft and so on, but it must not be at the expense of very critical issues for the kingdom of God. So for me, I take it that uh, pastors, 
need to be rich, but you must be rich in correspondence to the congregation you have. So if you have a congregation, is they are meeting in a classroom, there are more church building, then you are flying a, a plane, then there's a problem there. But if you have, like, they look at our Father in the Lord, I mean, if we, are, we need to buy, a, is it the eight, seven, what do you call it, the Dreamliner, or one of these big fly planes, we could have bought one for him, because really, his ministry corresponds to what he has done. The ministry can sustain him. And he needs it also for the ministry to advance, because sometimes he's delayed by a flight connecting here and there. Probably we needed to have bought one for him by now. But what I'm simply saying is that uh, the riches are good, but... We need to make sure they don't manage us. We need to manage them. It's not at the expense of the congregation, expense of the people of God, the church of God. The church of God must not suffer, get into debt, because we need to keep our pastor's children. Everyone wants to show off that they are pastor's children. It should not be like that. And God will help us. Uh, of course, we thank God for us. We don't have that problem. But there are many other cases like that. So for me, really, it's an issue of you can get what you need to get, but at what cost? What expense? Is it at the expense of God's kingdom? Then we need to manage that. So, I will, okay, I, will, I may not respond directly to the question, but I will give you some few points about riches. So, we are being taught in our lesson the need for having a proper perception about riches. Uh, let's look at a few scriptures. Go back to... eternal life. What a good to him. Which, and Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. He explained all the commandments. Verse 19, honor thy father and so on. Verse 20, the young man said unto him, all these have I kept from my youth up. What like I yet? There is a big question here and a challenge for all of us. Thank God for the revival we have, and that revival will continue in Jesus' name. This young man must have been going to church, don't you think so? Because he had some idea about the commandments and so on. But despite attending church service for me, it says for my youth up, I've grown up, he was not a youth at this time, he was an adult. He was a civil ruler, he was a, a very prominent person in society, but he was very rich. But he was relatively young. You can say the young adult or getting into a senior. But the, the, the man was, was, was very rich. But the challenge we have is that he's saying, I've gone through all this and I've been, I've been obeying some commandments from my youth up. If there's anything I'm lacking, uh, God will help us. Amen? Our children, our youth who pass through our hands will not grow up and then they don't realize what is lacking in their lives they will be able to seek God and get saved. Amen? Amen. This, this man, he says, I, I haven't lacked anything. What have I lacked? From my youth up, I've, I've known all these things. And it's very possible to observe certain commandments and not be fully born again like this young man. It's very possible. You grow up as a, in the children's church, they teach you A, B, C, no, don't do this. And you do that. But at the end of the day, you have not fully submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. Here, the core issue about this man is the Lordship of Christ. Jesus had the say, on his life, but not a complete say. Jesus could direct him, oh, obey your parents, do that. He, he knew all those commandments. But the one of Jesus touching his riches, Jesus had no say. It's like he was not ready to bend. Are there some areas in our individual lives as believers where we have put God in the corner, say, God, this, this area, don't speak about it. I know what to do there. Don't, I don't want anyone to preach about this area. Don't teach anything about this area. As far as I'm concerned, as long as I'm, I'm obeying A, B, C, D, I'm okay. We need to have God have absolute control of our lives. Amen? Every area of our life, God must have a say, and we are bent, ready to bend. That's why we call him our Lord and our Savior. He's a Lord. He's a director. If he says, can you give me your riches, you are ready to part for the sake of God's kingdom. But when we resist, it means there's a sign of a challenge. So it's a challenge for this young man, but I pray God will help us. With we and our children, our youths, everyone who grow up in the fear of the Lord in Jesus' name. Let me summarize a few points on the riches. Number one, the challenge about riches, number one, is the drive 
the haste to be rich. That's the biggest problem. In the book of Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28, verse 20, that's the biggest challenge. The riches are not bad, but when you want to get them so, so quickly, so quickly at the expense of others, a faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. That's where the problem is. When you're so quick to be rich, you want to get rich quick, not through the normal procedure of hard work. You want to go the other way, crooked means and so on. There's a temptation to be able to do what is wrong. You will not be innocent. That's what the Bible is saying. So it's a, it's a drive to be rich. Number two, it's a problem of deceitfulness of riches. Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Riches can be very deceitful. Sometimes when people have riches, they think that they have arrived and everything is okay. They don't need anything else again. Mark chapter 4, verse 19. The Bible says in verse 19, and the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So the, the, the riches can be very deceitful. You, you, you feel like, since I have this, so what, am I, what do I need more? What do I lack? I don't need God. And that's why when you're having a crusade and you're preaching, and there's a rich man there, a rich man will not want to raise up his hand. He feels like his status is so big. Him it should be done in the corner, in the, in the boardroom. That's when we can discuss about salvation. Not on the, on the crusade field, because of the status and all that. So those are the challenges we have. They can be very deceitful where you begin to think you are higher than everyone else, and you don't need God, and there's a danger in that. Number three, there's also a problem of drifting hearts away from the Lord. The riches in Psalm 62, let me read from verse 10. Psalm 62, verse 10, the riches can drift away somebody's heart from the Lord. Psalm 62 verse 10 says, Trust not in oppression and become not, uh, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. The riches can drift your heart away from the Lord. Um, okay, here when we talk about riches, we're just talking about variable possessions. And uh, sometimes when it says riches, we always ex exclude ourselves but you might be included in one or the other. When you say someone is rich, it's relative, isn't it? It's compared to other people. So for you, when probably back home, where, when you arrive, people see you as a rich man. But here you may be comparing yourself with the Bill Gates and the rest. You feel like you are not. So it's applicable to all of us, amen? So we need to be thinking about how do I manage the riches, the riches I have, the resources I have, and so on. And even when we are not rich, we are still poor, we're still looking for how to make riches, and so make ends meet. There are sometimes the, the pursuit of just how to make ends meet can actually drift you away from the Lord if you're not careful. So we need to be careful about our own jobs. Does this job take me away from the Lord? Uh, I, before you got a job, maybe used to be very regular, always available. But when now the job has come, he, he, he coming to church is, uh, you, 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 God must appreciate you that you actually came. Because you are so busy with pursuing your personal pursuits and so on. So we need to be careful that the riches don't drown our hearts away in Jesus' name. Number four, the riches problem is dependency. Mark chapter 10, verse 24, people trust in uncertain riches. We begin to lean on them and not depend on God. And that becomes a challenge. That's a challenge of riches. Number five, he said dangers. There are many other dangers of these riches. They may trigger pride and... Um, also, the, the anxieties, and they take away time for God. So sometimes when you have so many riches, you have challenges about how to manage them. They begin to manage you. Sleeping time, you don't sleep the normal time, because a call will come and say, okay, this side, that project you had, this is what has happened. Somebody has actually stolen. The other side, again, something has happened. So you are, you are all over carried away. Your mind is thinking about how to make sure they don't steal everywhere. We can be carried away by the, the, the riches. God will help us in Jesus' name. Well, number, is it number six? They can also um, direct or rule our lives. So we need to be careful we have contentment. Closely, let me close up with the last part. We need to have durable riches. Riches are not bad, but we need to strike a balance. The riches of this life, the riches of God's kingdom. In the book of Luke chapter 12, verse 21, this is where... Our patriarchs actually beat us a lot in this area because for them, they had riches in this life, but they also reached towards God. Luke chapter 12, verse 21. 
Luke 12, 21 says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. If you have the riches of this life and you're also rich towards God, you are investing in your spiritual life and making sure that you, you are aiming to enter heaven at last. You would have done all the best for your life. God will help us in Jesus' name. The writer in 1 Timothy 6, verse 12 says, You must lay hold on eternal life. Whilst we are making money in this life, we are doing our work, Meeting our needs, we must not forget that we need to lay hold on eternal life. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Let's rise together as we pray. Let's talk to God in prayer. There could be, you may not be as rich as other big people, but probably, are you, are you being managed by the riches now, the resources you have, the valuables you have? Are they managing you? The job, the job managing you, we are not managing it. You do have the ability to put everything under control and make sure that God is not put number last. God still rules and reigns in your heart. Let's talk to God in prayer. God, help me. I don't want to miss heaven at last. I want to make it. I want to lay hold on eternal life. I don't want to miss heaven. I want to be rich towards God. Not just rich towards the resources of this life. Let's talk to God in prayer. Hallelujah. Our God is good. He is so good. I don't know the good things he has done for you throughout this week. But the fact that you are alive is a reason that God is good. Amen. We call him holy. We call him righteous. We call him faithful. We call him everything. He's holy. Hallelujah. I call you holy. Your name is holy. You are so holy. about him and his holy.
It. Can we make it louder? He deserves it. He deserves it. He deserves our clap offerings this morning. Let me tell your neighbor, have you seen what God has done? He has destroyed the works of darkness in your life. Have you seen what the Lord has done? He has destroyed the works of Satan. He has given you victory. That's why we say, oh, yeah. Have you seen what the Lord has done? He has destroyed the works of Satan. Oh, 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 
I don't know what the doctor has told you. I don't care if he says you have cancer. But what he tells me is that I am healed. I don't care if I see the manifestation of cancer in me. All I know is that he has said I am healed. Do you believe it? Yes, Lord, we believe in his word. We believe his promises. We believe he is God. It's not a fantasy. We just believe that he is God. Yes, Jesus. Keep telling yourself, keep telling yourself that I believe, I believe, I believe in the Son of God. Dark 
greatest love. You became my light with your healing hand to redeem my life in my darkest hour. You became my light with your. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
are my friend, you are my father, you are the only eyes that I see through, only to you I devote my praise, I'm forever to you. What do you call him? You are my king. Father, word to him. Can you call him that name? 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 That name, that name. When there was no way, he was your way maker. When there was sickness, he was your healer. When everybody despised you, he was there to encourage you. The one that you were neglected, then he came and just beautify your life. You were nobody, but he became somebody. Ah, Jesus. of his people worship him this morning tell him you are devoted to his praise you are devoted to his honor he has done many things for us the psalmist says in Psalm 100 verse 3 said know ye the Lord know ye that the Lord is God it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The sheep of his pasture. Here we come to the last Sunday in the month of August. There are many pastures that are infested with wolves. But God has positioned us to be sheep of his pasture. Because we surrender ourselves as sheep to him. Indeed, the Lord has been our shepherd, and we have not wanted our protection. Give him glory. Give him praise. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be exalted. In Jesus' precious mighty name, we are worship. In Jesus' mighty name, we worship. My prayer to God for you and myself that the voice of joy, the voice of praise will not cease in our home, will not cease in our tabernacle in Jesus' name. Until the very end, when we shall, when the blue sky is open and we fly to meet those saints of old, 
to sing the chorus of hallelujah i pray that voice of gladness and rejoicing will not cease in our life in jesus name please don't your neighbor and tell him how you are welcoming to his presence yes in his presence there is fullness of joy at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore and our joy will increase this morning in jesus name let's have our seat in his presence uh, this deeper life bible church washington dc is always a pleasure to recognize people who are worshiping with us for the first time so if you are here with us in the sanctuary and this is your first time of worshiping with us or probably you are a returning guest we want you to do us a favor by raising up your hand and then we can extend the pastor's greetings to you yes i can say we'll do it I can go ahead, take a step forward by standing up for better recognition and what do we say to them george this morning in jesus name we want to know you better can you please do us a favor by telling us your name the microphone is waiting for you i'm petty for emmanuel so i came from florida because i'm having a joint uh, program with the catholic university so i just moved to washington dc so that's why i'm here today you are powerfully welcoming to our miss in jesus name thank you and god bless you as you worship with us today Good morning, everybody. My name is Florent Meles from Cote d'Ivoire. I'm here for returning with IMF for two weeks. God bless you, sir. You're welcome to our meeting in Jesus' name. And I can also see one of our senior citizens. You are powerfully welcome, sir. No, he is he's just returning. Papa. Yes, give us give up to Papa. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. God bless you, sir. Thank you. We miss you so much. We're happy to have you in our midst once again. Amen. God bless you, sir. Thank you. You're all welcome in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, for those who are watching us on the various social media platform, you're also welcome to our midst. If you're on Zoom or YouTube, please do us a favor by sending us your name and the city in which you are with fellowship with us from, and the representative of the leadership will get in, in touch with you. I pray that as you worship with us this morning, we all have an encounter with the Savior of our soul in Jesus' name. Uh, for more information about our weekly fellowship, uh, the media will give us a clip, and I will step aside for a moment. Welcome to church. We are so glad to have you here this morning. This is Deeper Life Bible Church, Washington, D.C. There will be many opportunities to fellowship with us during the week, so please listen closely to the following announcements. On Sundays, we begin with intercessory prayers at 8.30 a.m. and the service starts at 9 a.m. Later on Sunday evenings, we meet in smaller units for house caring fellowship. Make sure to get connected to your fellowship unit before the end of today's service. We believe the Holy Bible is the true word of God. That is why we meet every Monday at 6.20 p.m. as our founder, Pastor W.F. Kumoyi, takes us through the scriptures. Join us this Monday as we study the word together. If you're a senior citizen, I invite you to come join us on Wednesdays from 6 to 7 p.m. for an evening with Jesus. During this time, we encourage ourselves in the Lord as we worship with one another. Seniors, don't miss this time of fellowship. All children are welcome to join the kids' Bible discussion every Thursday at 6 p.m. 
This is a fun time where we learn about Jesus, his word, and how we can live for him. Join us this Thursday. I hope to see you there. Youths, get excited for your weekly fellowship every Thursday at 7 p.m. It's a time for us to study God's word together so that we can be all that he has called us to be. What a great place to be. You can't miss it for anything. Fridays are a time for revival service where we hope to be encouraged and strengthened as we continue to seek the Lord. Join us this Friday at 6.20 p.m. for a time of seeking the Lord. Every third Friday is our community fellowship. Make sure to be part of this avenue for soul winning and let's impart our word for the Lord. Offering time, blessing time. Blessing time, offering time. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 tells us to honor the Lord with our substance and with the first fruit of our increase. If you brought tithes and offerings, please bring them out now. We honor the Lord in, with our offering. Let's dip our hands into our pockets and into our purses as we pray on our offering. Almighty Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to have a living, to make a living, and out of the abundance you've given to us who brought this token, we pray that you sanctify the gift and use it for your glory in Jesus' name. As many who are willing to give but have none, we pray together as a church, we pray that this new week we open up with new messages of provision for everyone in Jesus' name. Thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus' precious name we pray. For those in the sanctuary, please, you can drop your offering into the offering bags. And uh, for those watching us on the various uh, platforms, social media platforms, uh, the, the information you can look, take advantage of the information on your screen and send in your tithe and offering accordingly. God bless you. As we are submitting our offering, our, memory, our Bible reading today will be taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 8. Matthew 8. Before we take our Bible reading, we have something, a piece of information is coming in. If you misplace a white envelope, please uh, get in touch with the hushers and they will um, give them a claim to, uh, to take, receive it back to yourself. All right, our Bible reading will be taken back, to, will be taken at, from the book of uh, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, That many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Then Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities, and bare our sicknesses. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What man of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled, and went their ways into the city, and told everything, and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils, and behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus.